Well, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 6 today. The chapter of the lion's den. And I think for many of us, it is one of our favorite stories in the Bible. What, what we don't always appreciate is that by the time we come to chapter 6, Daniel is 90 years of age or thereabouts. He is an old man. An old man is going to go down into the pit with these lions. We, we don't read of his companions. It's not that it matters, is it, really? We, we don't know whether these men are alive or not. But this is Daniel's chapter, as it was with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in Daniel chapter 3. And we also see it's a chapter of Darius. I'm going to see in a moment that it's actually Darius's chapter. We might be surprised about that. We, we often think about Daniel chapter 6 being the chapter of Daniel in the lion's den. But I'm going to show you a structure that would suggest that actually this chapter is all about the conversion of Darius. And that's the lesson, I believe, this morning. Well, we've come to the metal of silver. God has proven to be correct. Nebuchadnezzar's image was wrong, as was foretold, or Nebuchadnezzar, his interpretation of that image was wrong, and the silver kingdom has arrived. Now, what we've got on the screen here is um, a suggested chiastic structure of Daniel chapter 6. And, and what we'd like to note is that at the beginning and the end, it's all about Daniel's success. But at the heart of the matter of this chapter, you can see that it's about the hopes of Darius and um, Darius witnessing Daniel's deliverance. And I believe that that's the heart of this chapter. Though it is important that Daniel went into the lion's den, this is another opportunity of Almighty God working in another king's heart. He's worked in Nebuchadnezzar. Can now God save Darius, the king of the Medes? Well, let's just read then these opening verses of chapter 6. It's a chapter we're very familiar with. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Well, I'd like you to notice that phrase there. No damage there in verse 2. And it literally means to suffer no loss. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because what it is talking about is financial honesty. It's talking about someone who will ensure that there's no theft or fraud or embezzlement or cheating. These are the qualities that Daniel was already known for. And, and this is clear because by now Babylon was degenerate or had become degenerate. The moral climate was rotten. The officials of Babylon had become men who had little interest in anything except lining their own pockets and feathering their own nests. And a change of government was required. And this is what Darius does. He sets these three presidents and these 120 princes to rule this new kingdom. But as we know, any new government doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a change in the moral positioning. And isn't that true, brothers and sisters? We see that in governments around the world. New presidents, prime ministers are ushered in, and they are no different. And this was the concern of Darius, that this might be a replica of Babylon. And so to ensure that it wasn't, Daniel was placed there as number two, we're going to see, in the kingdom. Well, he was 90 years of age, or thereabouts, and we can see that in verse 3, that he has this excellent spirit. Remember that? We saw that yesterday, didn't we? It was said of the queen, remember that? In Belshazzar's banquet, well, we see it again there in verse 3. He had an excellent spirit. And perhaps then, the image of Daniel wearing the golden chain around his neck on that faithful night when Cyrus came in and, and, and beheld the writing on the wall, perhaps then, this never left Darius. On that particular night, as we said, when the, court, the curtains were drawn at the end of this empire of Babylon. It was Daniel who was there, left standing for that fleeting moment. He was the king of Babylon, looking all regal and in control. 
Now, he is someone who was preferred by Darius, the greatest king of the earth at this time. And we notice there in verse 3, he was preferred. I'd like us to look at that word because it's an important word. It means to excel, to distinguish himself. Already at the beginning of this next phase in the silver empire, this man had differentiated himself. He was excelling in everything that he did. He was someone who was exceptional in morals and in character and in disposition, brothers and sisters. Now the root of that word preferred is to be bright, to be preeminent and to be perpetual. So it's a bright light that never goes out. It is a perpetual light. And so, brothers and sisters, in this dark, dark time in Babylon and now in the Medo-Persian reign, in this spiritual time of darkness, there was this lantern. And he was Daniel. And he never flickered. And he was always on, brothers and sisters. And he was exceptional. And wherever he went in this dark age, he could be spotted. Isn't that wonderful? What an example for ourselves. And as soon as Darius beheld this man, he said, he's the man for me. And God, through Daniel now, is going to work as agents upon this king's heart. Now, envy and jealousy is a terrible thing, isn't it? It happens in ecclesial life at times. It happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this chapter. That at its heart, the core of the problem was envy and jealousy over these leaders in this new empire. Well, we'll notice that there were three presidents, so there were two other presidents and 120 princes. And we go down to verse 4, and if you look at verse 4, well, let's read it together. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. That's 122 men concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So we have 122 men who are pursuing to find error and fault in Daniel. And I want you to imagine that, brothers and sisters, what life would be like for you if you were going to work and you had your colleagues who were plotting and scheming to find some error and fault in you. How would you feel each morning when your alarm went off and you were going to work, knowing that your colleagues were obsessed in bringing you down? And I heard being there. So some of us will be able to relate with something that is going on here. They were watching him like a hawk. They were examining him. They were dissecting him. They were analyzing, weren't they? They were probing and they were evaluating. They wanted to find something that was wrong with this man. Well, there's 122 high-powered, trained, diligent civil servants who were going to try and find something against Daniel. That's 122 verses 1 but they couldn't find anything on him, which is astonishing. So I ask you, how long would it take 122 of you to find error and fault in me? Well, not long at all. You'd only have to have a brief conversation with Lindsay or my children, and you'd find plenty. <laughs> but she's not here. <laughs> they tried to find error or fault. I want you to look at that, brothers and sisters. There's two things that are going on here. The word error means neglect or remiss. The word fault is corruption. Two very different words. They were looking for evidence of negligence or corruption. Now, we wouldn't want to think that we are corrupt, would we, brothers and sisters? So at times, I'm sure there are certain things that we do that go amiss. But let's assume for a moment that we are brothers and sisters, and we are true to God, and we are not corrupt, but negligent. Back home in England, we would call that dotting the I's and crossing the T's. I don't know whether that means anything to you. He didn't miss a thing, brothers and sisters, and he was 90 years of age. Nothing went amiss. He was 100% right, 100% of the time. When there was Bible class, he didn't neglect his work. The work was completed but he was still there at Bible class. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? And there would be plenty of excuses. We could excuse Daniel, couldn't we? 
for making a few faults at work at 90 years of age. And he didn't make a thing. Not one. That's the man we are considering this morning. A man who's going to be spoken to by Gabriel, O Daniel, greatly beloved. For me, I can't find a greater character in the Old Testament. A wonderful, wonderful man. It humbles me just to talk about him. Well, brothers and sisters, there is a topic that we all know very well in Christadelphia, and it's very sad that I share this with you. We know all about character assassination, don't we? We all know about character assassination. And this is what they try and do with Daniel. They try to assassinate this man. We, we could imagine, and, 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 and this was a serious thing, wasn't it? We call it MI5. You would call it CIA. This is the government bringing on the forces to find something wrong with this man. And they could find nothing with him. And so, they find one thing that would potentially compromise this man. He had one weakness, he had one flaw. He was a man of prayer. And he prayed, ritually, habitually, three times a day. And they're going to bring this man down. And they rub their hands with excitement, don't they? Now, I wonder, brothers and sisters, if you were in Babylon, or the Medes and the Persians there, two and a half thousand years ago, would that be your weakness? Could you be brought down if you were denied prayer? Let's be honest with ourselves. If you didn't pray for a month, would it change any aspect of your life? It would bring this man totally down without it. He couldn't go on living without prayer. It was more important to him than food itself or air. Let's be honest, brothers and sisters. If we were denied prayer for a month in our families, in our ecclesias, perhaps in ecclesias, yes. It would feel rather odd, wouldn't it, without any prayers in our meetings. But at home, when we go to bed, when we're driving the car, would it make any difference, really? Well, it did with Daniel, brothers and sisters. And look what they do in verse 6. And I want you to notice this, the word all. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes. This is everyone. In your little books that you read to your children and grandchildren, when we read this story, there's just a few pictures of men who were involved plotting Daniel's downfall. This is everyone. This is 120 princes and two presidents. And we're going to find their families as well. It's a whole kingdom that has turned on Daniel. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the councillors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of God or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So, so notice here, they assembled. The word assembled there in verse 6. It means to come tumultuously. It was very crafty. One morning the king woke up and he saw a crowd in his reception. They were taking this man off guard and they rush in and they say, king, 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 we've got this great idea. You need to make a decree. And they knew that this was a man who loved his ego flattered. We're no different, are we, brothers and sisters? We can end up doing all kinds of things when our egos are flattered. And soon the king was full of excitement because the proposal was rather appealing. You're a god, Darius. And there can't be any worship to any god for 30 days, only through you, because you are the, the representative of the gods in heaven. You're a mediator upon the earth. And he loved the idea. And, and I notice here that they all come in and they, they rush in and they say, it's all of us. Yet he knew that Daniel was his preferred one. He knew that Daniel was absent, but he was so taken up in the spirit of it. It didn't matter for that moment. And that moment was going to have huge consequences. He knew that Daniel would never agree to this. Never. He knew that Daniel was a man of God, a man of Yahweh. Can you see, brothers and sisters, that's human nature. When we know something to be wrong, 
when we get flattered, we get excited. We can do all kinds of things, can't we? Well, it's fair to say that we would have panicked. You imagine if an official statement was made in America tomorrow by Donald Trump, who's been appointed by God, that you couldn't read your Bible and you couldn't come together and worship. What would you do, brothers and sisters? Would you come up with ways of going undetected? Would you meet in obscure places? Would you hide yourself at home? Would you, cut, would you draw the curtains? Or would you rush to the nearest airport and get yourself an international visa and come over to Britain? I don't know. What would you do? Well, with Daniel, there was no change. He was a man of routine. Routines are good, brothers and sisters. Routines are very good. Prayer and our daily readings. We need routines. And this is Daniel. Nothing changed with this man. And he's 90 years of age, brothers and sisters. And, and it all boils down, when I reflected upon this, it all boils down to values again, doesn't it? Remember how we've spoken about values. There was the king, and he honoured the king. He was preferred by the king. But he served his God. And serving his God was more important. So he made God absolute, didn't he? In that situation, he made God absolute. He made the king relative. This has been this warfare, this battle, this contest, all the way through these opening chapters of Daniel. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? He made God absolute in his life. And look at this. When you look at um, where Daniel goes here, you can see that he goes into the upper chamber. Notice that. He goes into his upper chamber as aforetime. Verse 10. And his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day. Now, by that phrase there, chamber or word, I wonder if, whether you've got a, a connection, a, a Bible connection. I, I've got one here, and it takes me, we're not going to look there, it takes me all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 19, one of the most famous chapters in your Bible. What's that chapter about? 1 Kings 17, sorry. No, not 1 Samuel. 1 Kings chapter 17, it's Elijah with the widow at Zarephath and how Elijah takes the widow's son up into the loft and prays and the life of the child is restored, the first recorded resurrection in your Bible and that's the reference back. So Daniel had this loft just like the widow of Zarephath. And he was praying, as it were, brothers and sisters, for his own resurrection. He knew that his life was being placed in God's hands. But there's another lovely lesson there. He had a place within his home where he could be alone with God, away from the distractions and the noises of every single day. And brothers and sisters, do you have a place like that? How important is prayer to you that you've got a place that you can go to and there are no emails, there are no distractions, there are no noises that you are alone with, just your God. And this is what Daniel did three times a day and over 30 days it's going to be 90 times in that loft with the windows open looking to Jerusalem, the city of the king, the city of his hope. Can you see that brothers and sisters? What a character. What a personality we have before us. Where was the lion's den? Where was the lion's den? It wasn't in the pit, brothers and sisters. What was the test for Daniel? The test was not the pit. No. The test was to deny his God three times a day for 30 days. And he opened up his window and he saw the den of lions outside his window ready to devour him. Can you see that? That was the test. It had nothing to do with the pit. That was the test, whether he would be prepared to 
deny his God. Now, how can a 90-year-old man behave in such a way? How can he summon up so much faith? Because he's been doing it since Daniel chapter 1, hasn't he? The king's meat. He wouldn't defile himself. What did he do? He purposed within his heart. He's been doing this for 70 years. Every day. Don't think, brothers and sisters, that when we have a test in our lives, that we have the, the, the spiritual fortitude to overcome. We have to put habitual routines in our lives. So when the big challenges come our way, in faith and God's strength, we can deal with it. Can you see that? It's like an athlete. He's training every single day. This was his Goliath. This was his contest, brothers and sisters. Now just, just think about that for a moment. He's told that he needs to be denied a prayer for 30 days. And this was his routine, opening up the windows. What would stop Daniel just walking down the street and, and muttering a private prayer that no one ever knew about? Like we do occasionally when we're with company at work at lunchtime. What would stop him saying a prayer without muttering words or moving his lips? Nothing. Can you see that? He could pray. He could pray in the privacy of his room. This was more than prayer, brothers and sisters. He was not prepared to change his routine. I'm going to the meeting. That's what I do on Sundays. I go to Bible class on Tuesday. I will go to that Bible school. Can you see that? These are routines. And he wasn't prepared to change them for anything or anyone. This wasn't prayer. This was a life. I will not change my life for anything or anyone. It's very powerful, brothers and sisters. And it certainly relates to ourselves. Now, you can imagine the peer pressure here. There was Daniel. He's on the brink, arguably, of becoming the king. He's number two. Daniel, if you just do this and say private prayers within your home, you could send us back. The king will favor you. And I believe that God's appointed you in that preferred position. Help us, Daniel. Can you see that? There would have been tremendous peer pressure. But Daniel was a man who had a relationship with his God first and foremost before the relationship that he had with his brothers and sisters. And that's where he prioritized. And that's where we need to prioritize too, brothers and sisters. Though there were 122 lions outside his window. If you look at the words, how many were standing outside his window? Well, let me just show you this. It's a very simple exercise. It starts in verse 4, then the presidents and the princes. And, and, and notice that this group, it's 122 of them all the way through the chapter. All the way through the chapter. So presidents and princes, and then verse 4, they. Verse 5, are these men. Verse 6, these presidents and, pre and, and princes. Verse 11, these men. Verse 12, they. Verse 13, they. Verse 15, these men. And then verse 24, men, those, them, their, their, them, their, they. It's the whole group. So quite accidentally, there happened to be 122 men standing outside his window. That's peer pressure, isn't it? When you feel alone. And Daniel was never alone, brothers and sisters. Well, Daniel acted like a rock. However, even a rock with constant dripping of water can be eroded away. But not with Daniel. Many of the most dangerous temptations are the subtle and the gentle ones, aren't they, brothers and sisters? The ones that only you know about, and no one else knows about them. And they're like drops on a stone. And they're all about you and your relationship with Almighty God. And what do you do, brothers and sisters? 
And I believe that the real trial here in Daniel chapter 6 is, is his daily temptation of not praying. This was his real den of lions. And I ask you, what do you think was the greater miracle? His refusal to stop praying or his deliverance from the lion's den? What was the miracle, brothers and sisters, in this chapter? Well, they knew that Daniel would not deny himself. They were rubbing their hands with excitement. And this is going to set in motion the wheels that would lead to his execution. And look what Darius says. He says there, in verse 14, that he was sore displeased. Now, you might be amused with the screen. The word sore displeased there means to stink. He knows that he has um, produced, as it were, a foul smell. Daniel was this beacon of integrity. He was this bright light. He was an honorable man. He was a man that Darius had commissioned to such lofty position of authority. And now Darius feels that he's a stinker. He's a rotter. He's a cheat. These are the thoughts of the king. Now what we want to do, we want to look at this chiastic structure here that draws us into the section of verses 16 to 23. And I've said that this is the chapter of Darius. If we can just remember one thing, this is the chapter of Darius, not the lion's den. Because God is acting, I believe, on this man's heart. And the lion's den is a means by which that would be achieved. Well, we see that the king tried to rescue Daniel. If he'd been Nebuchadnezzar as an autocrat, then he could have, but this was a constitutional monarchy. He brings in his lawyers, we read there, but he can't find a loophole. And he's broken-hearted. He knows that through his foolishness and his vanity, he's got to send this man to the den of lions, his execution chamber, and there was nothing that he could do. And a royal seal is placed on the entrance to the den. Any attempt to rescue this man would be high treason. Let's just pick up now in verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might, might, might not be changed concerning Daniel. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? At the end of verse 17. So a royal seal is placed upon uh, the face there of this den, this pit. And, and notice, if you look at verse 12, when they came and had this idea, these 122 men, you see there at the end of verse 12, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. Now, I'm sure we all know that with the law and the Medes and Persians, it had a, a certain inflexibility in it that once it was made, nothing could change it, not even the king. That's why Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. He could do anything. But notice here, you would expect, by the time we come to the end of verse 17, that we would be reminded that this is the law of the Medes and the Persians. So the king, though you love this young man, or this old man here, 90 years of age, though you love this man, you can't do anything about it. But it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say the law of the Medes and the Persians. It says there, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And I believe, brothers and sisters, it's written like that because Darius was there at the pit and he's going to go there early in the morning. And when he read those words, he was personally being reminded, you can't do anything, Darius. Not even for Daniel. It's like a personal message for the king. No one else wanted to bring this man out of the pit. It was only Darius. A personal message for him. This would be treason and your own death. But look at this. I love this, brothers and sisters. Look halfway down, or near the end of verse 16. What is Darius' first reaction? I don't believe at this point in time he believed in the God of Israel. He's going to be converted, but he says there, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Now, what does Darius say? Because you've been so faithful in going down into the pit, that's not going to be unnoticed. God, your God, is going to notice that. He doesn't say that. What, what does he say, brothers and sisters? And he says it again at the end of verse 20. Continually. Darius knew that this man had behaved in this way for 70 years. And because of that behavior for 70 years, he would be saved from the pit. 
Can you see that, brothers and sisters? It was a lifetime of devotion. It was a lifetime of faithfulness. That's why D Daniel, at, at 90 years of age, was saved from the pit. Because of a lifetime of commitment. He had nothing to do with what he was doing then. It was what he had done every single day of his life. At the end, this is God's evaluation of Daniel. This is God's thankfulness and praise of Daniel. Because of a lifetime as an exile. In faithfulness, I will save you from the pit. And we know that that's confirmed because in Hebrews 11 it says, By faith, it says, they were stopped. God stopped the mouth of lions. By faith. Faith stopped the mouth of lions. A continual faith that was continually executed for a lifetime, for 70 years. Have any of you seen this picture in the flesh? Wonderful. So it's at, the, um, it's at Washington. I was planning to go and see this with Brother Ron Hicks, and um, he was ill that day. Um, but it's wonderful, right? Um, it's a, a Rubens picture. It's in the National Gallery. It was painted in 1615. And Rubens was known to go into the zoo and, uh, and to look at lions. And he, he wanted to paint them in life-size uh, proportions. And, and you get no sense of the scale of this. There's a photograph of me standing by it. And um, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. It's a wonderful, wonderful painting. Just look at that. So you can see one of the lines is staring right back at you. Can you see that? Staring right back at you. Um, and, and because of the scale of these lines, it heightens the feeling of danger. Now you can see that most of them are either sleeping um, or um, certainly about to fall to sleep. Uh, you can see the scattered bones, so some have been less fortunate. Um, he looks um, a little frightening, doesn't he? The one behind, he looks like um, um, he's paying a bit of attention to Daniel. But what I want you to do, just look at the, the center of the picture, Daniel, with his fingers intertwined. You can see the pressure that Rubens felt that Daniel was, uh, was under. All right. really brings it to life. It certainly did for me, brothers and sisters. His prayer, this, this man of faith. But where was he summonsing his faith from? Well, I think there's a number of passages, brothers and sisters. C can you come to 1 Kings chapter 8? And it's a bit of an unlikely chapter, really, because when Solomon built the temple and the ark had been brought into Jerusalem, Solomon now makes a, a series of announcements to the people. And it's a, an unusual chapter because what he does, it anticipates the time when the children of Israel would be in captivity. And it's an unusual thing, isn't it? Because this is a day where they are celebrating the temple and the ark being brought into Jerusalem. Yet here, Solomon prophetically anticipates a time when the children of Israel would be taken into captivity. And it is a prayer for the nation. So let's begin in verse 32. You, you'll see why I've gone here in a moment. 1 Kings chapter 8 then and, and verse 32. Solomon says then, The ark has been brought into Jerusalem. Then hear thou in heaven and do and judge thy servants condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head and justify the righteous and give him according to righteousness. When the people be smitten down before the enemy. So unusual, isn't it? There is now Solomon talking about a future. And there's not a hint on this day that this is going to happen. This is great Solomon, the son of David. Because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house. Verse 34. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel. How... how fascinating and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers so not only have God's people sinned they're in exile and here now Solomon is saying bring them back please bring them back to the land and look at verse 45 then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause if they sin against thee for there is no man that sinneth not and thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near. 
So he's talking about a time when God's people will have sinned, that they have gone into captivity, and God now is going to bring them back. He's going to bring back the exiles into the land, which is really where we are in Daniel chapter 6. Now what I want you to notice there is this phrase, maintain their cause, there in verse 45. And if you glance down at the end of verse 49, it's the same phrase. So it's repeated for emphasis, maintain their cause. So this is the plea of Solomon. Please, when God's people are in exile, please, please God, maintain their cause. Now, now that phrase, maintain their cause, you may have in the margin, it means literally maintain their rights. Or even more precisely, maintain their judgment. Now, Daniel's name means God is my judge. Maintain their judgment. So what Solomon is saying, there will be a time when God's people will be in captivity and they will be surrounded by temptations. Maintain their judgment. Brothers and sisters, that's a prayer for us, isn't it? Maintain our judgment in understanding what is good and honourable and pleasing in God's sight. Maintain their judgment so that they can return. And Daniel's name is God is my judge. Was this a prayer, brothers and sisters? The, the children of Israel wouldn't have understood these words really. Was this a prayer for Daniel? I wonder. I wonder, brothers and sisters, when he opened up his window and he was looking out to Jerusalem, the place of this prayer, do you think the name, God is my judge. Do you think this was his prayer? Maintain my judgment. Three times a day for 30 days. Keep me strong. Maintain my judgment. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? He would certainly have it in mind, wouldn't he? I think this was a prayer for Daniel. Because we've already said that Ezekiel told all the children of Israel down at the river Kibar, Daniel's in the court. He's working for his children, though he had no natural children. The children of Israel, the family of God. And he's going to return us back to God's people. Brothers and sisters, what a lovely phrase. Try and remember 1 Kings chapter 8. Try and remember that phrase, maintain my judgment. Perhaps we can include that in our own personal prayers. Well, there's something else. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. the psalm of David. Here was the great king of Jerusalem, the very place that Daniel was looking towards. And here in this psalm he speaks of God's wonderful work of deliverance. Let's see if we can find some connecting ideas. We're going to find many. Verse 7 then. The angel of the Lord encampeth around those that fear him and delivereth them. Daniel had no fear over the king. The only one he feared was his God. That is the only one he wanted to please. Verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they seek the Lord, shall not want any good thing. And we know from Babylonian times they used to keep the lions hungry so that when they ate the victims, it was a, it was a marvelous display. It was like an exhibition. It was entertainment. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, we read there in verse 10. Verse 15, imagine Daniel here, alone in the pit. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Verse 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of their troubles. Verse 18, the Lord is, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Can you remember the signature of Daniel? An excellent spirit. It also means fragrance, by the way, not just value. Wherever Daniel went and all the big decisions that he made, it was like a beautiful fragrance. People would go into a room and go, oh, Daniel's been here. Though he made big decisions and they were hard decisions and he was letting people down, no, I won't do that. He did it in such a way that he didn't offend. And people said, this man is so consistent, so continual, I appreciate the stand he's made. Can you see that? How wonderful. If only life in ecclesial life was like that. And look at verse 20. He keepeth all his bones, 
not one of them is broken. And Daniel came out whole. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Well, there's many of these sounds, brothers and sisters, and I want to just quickly go through these. Some, come, we're just going to refer to them because there's a whole book of psalms about lions and being devoured and being protected by God. And, and Daniel would have known all of these. I don't think he feared the lions. Psalm 7, verse 1. O oh Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. Turn over a few pages to Psalm 10, verse 9. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him out into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. The wicked are like lions here, ready to pounce and attack. Daniel would have known all about that. Come to chapter 17 now, Psalm 17, verse 11. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like a lion that is greedy of his prey. And as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, and disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. And then the all-important one, Psalm 22. This Psalm of Messiah. Verse 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Verse 21, save me. Save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast hurt me from the horns of the unicorn. Well, the remainder of Daniel chapter 5 is about Daniel's deliverance. And I believe. Darius's conversion. When we go back, we can see that Darius couldn't sleep. And he's busy, isn't he? He's so busy. This is a man who couldn't rest. Just, just notice how many times we come across the phrase, the king. This sets this man into a, a state of chaos. Verse 16, the king. Verse 17, the king. Verse 18, the king. Verse 19, the king. Verse 20, he came, he cried, the king. Verse 23, the king. Verse 24, the king. Verse 25, King Darius. Can you see that? He's in a state of panic. He's going to lose maybe his best friend, Daniel. Daniel, this man with an excellent spirit. Well, as soon as the sun peaked above the horizon, this man was up like a flash and he ran to the den. And he cried with a nervous voice, verse 20, And when he came to the den, Darius, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. And as soon as these words left this man's lips, he heard a sound from the heart of the den. And look at the next verse, O king, live forever. This was the voice of one who he thought was dead. But now he is wishing Darius life. When everyone thought that Daniel was sharing the night with lions, he was holding company with God's angel. Just like his three friends, when everyone thought that they were being burnt alive in the flames, he was having fellowship with Lan like the Son of God, brothers and sisters. That is sweet community, that is sweet fellowship, isn't it? Well, verse 23 then, we read, The king was exceedingly glad, and they brought Daniel out of the den, while all his enemies and their wives and their children were thrown into them. Look at this, verse 24. I don't know whether you've ever really thought about this verse in the way that it reads. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, their children, their wives, their lions, and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Well, who were the accusers of Daniel? Well, you have two presidents and 120 princes. 
And now you have the wives. And let's assume that you have, on average, two children per family. That's 500 thrown into the den. And it tells us before all of them hit the ground, their bones were broken and they were devoured by the lions. Another miracle was performed. The mouths of these lions were opened and they were devoured instantly, I would suggest, brothers and sisters. And can you remember what it says in the closing words of Psalm 34? Can you remember that? It says, doesn't it, that it would be the enemies that would be consumed. It would be the enemies that would be consumed, yet the faithful would be able to count his bones. Psalm 34 played out beautifully in Daniel chapter 6. Well, what I want to do, we, we, we've just gone a little over. Please excuse me by just going over a few more moments because I just want to um, make a, a little connection to Peter um, where Brother Brian has been with us this week. Come with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're just going to run through these verses here. We've already seen that Peter draws on Daniel chapter 3. I think also, under inspiration, Daniel is drawn out in uh, the first epistle, but chapter 6. And we're going to just quickly go through these so that you've got them as marks in your Bible. So, first of all, then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thanksworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffer wrongfully. There was Daniel. He suffered wrongfully. He knew that he didn't consent to this agreement. Yet he turned the other cheek. He was buffeted, but he accepted it. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer it for it and take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. That's exactly what he did. He was... Humble, he turned the other cheek and he was prepared not to change his routine. Come to chapter 3 now and verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good and let him seek peace and ensue, and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and the ears are open unto their prayers. Where have you read that? That's a quotation from Psalm 34. Directly. The chapter of the lions. Isn't that interesting? Well, you come to chapter 5 and verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the, un uh, unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. This is the character of Daniel, a man clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, like Nebuchadnezzar, like Belshazzar, like Darius today, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, it says. Therefore unto the mighty hand of God, that ye may ex be exalted to you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, be, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, notice, walketh about seeking whom we may devour. Now, now, this roaring lion here is a metaphor for sin, and sin surrounds us all, brothers and sisters, as a roaring lion. And here, Peter, I believe, under inspiration, he's saying, think of Daniel, think of Babylon. Here we read in verse 13, the church, the ecclesia, that is in Babylon. These are the connections. Think of Daniel and the lion's den. Think of the conversion of Darius. Well, one final point. When you come back to Daniel and chapter 6, God achieved what he set out to do. If you look at this lovely statement that Darius wrote to peoples and nations and languages. We've already seen that phrase before. And you can see the full thing reverse now. And notice in verse 26, we're not going to read these verses in the interest of time, but it runs all the way down to verse 27, how Darius refers to God. He refers to God seven times. 
perfect things had happened within his heart. I believe, brothers and sisters, it's a statement of a covenant here. I do believe that Darius was truly converted. So we come to the end of our week, brothers and sisters, sadly. Our world is becoming more opposed to God's word and our beliefs. There is a rising prejudice against anyone who's, who is prepared to protest. In a world that has no absolute value and makes everything relative, we may feel that we are in an impossible situation. When we are commanded to conform, to eat the king's meat, to bow down to the golden image and to deny our God, this opposition to the Bible is like a roaring lion. We are all Daniel in our lion's den. And every day we can feel the hot breath of the lion breathing upon us. The roar is for us to shut up, to conform, to follow, to obey. The world we live in is literally a pit in every sense of the word. The battle we face is huge. But we are not alone. Just as an angel stood in the fire with Daniel's three friends. And just as an angel spent an evening with Daniel in the lion's den. The angels of the Lord encamp rows that fear him. And so brothers and sisters for the time being we say our goodbye. We have had a lovely week of fellowship together. And can we even imagine what this fellowship must be like. For all eternity. That is the prospect that we have been given. A Bible school for all eternity. And it's ours. It's ours, brothers and sisters, if we're prepared to muster the faith from somewhere and stand up and be counted. So let us continue standing up for God.